Good afternoon. Is this, uh, did we hear this from the back? Thanks. Uh, welcome to today's Lifelong Learning Committee lecture. Our guest speaker this afternoon is Clay Eels. Clay is a co-writer of the Now and Then Photo History column in the Pacific Northwest Magazine and insert in the weekly Sunday Times. Clay is a veteran newspaper man, book author, historian, and the recent winner of the Seattle Historic Society's Preservation Award, award in 2023. Today, Clay will share with us an insider's perspective about the now and then column in the Seattle Times. Comment on its founder, the current writers to the weekly column, and stories, stories published over the last 30 years, and maybe how they find those eye-catching historical photographs featured in each weekly story. Please welcome Clay Eels. Thank you, Mike. Um, can you all hear me? Um, this will be, uh, this is a complicated computer situation, but I, I'm hoping that I can get through it all right. How many of you read the Seattle Times on Sunday? Oh, gee. I should ask, how many of you don't read the Times on Sunday? Ooh, you've got an assignment. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I'm glad I'm talking with a, with a, a favorable crowd, because uh, newspapers are dying. You, we all know that. And uh, it's not a happy prospect. And yet, we've got to do all we can to keep them alive. Uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but we are very fortunate, when I say we, I'm talking about my column partner, Gene Sherrard, and I, that we are able to carry on a very special column in the Seattle Times. Now I'm going to ask another question. I don't expect quite as many hands in the air. How many of you were reading the Seattle Times back in 1982? Oh boy! That's about 20 people, my goodness. 1982 was when the Now and Then column began. Gene and I do the column now, but the guy who started the column is this man right here. This is Paul Dorpat. Uh, it's a photo I took of him down in Pioneer Square in 2018. Um, he started this in his early 40s in, in 1982. Some of you may remember that in the late 70s, early 80s, Paul put together a couple of booklets. One, the first one was called 294 Glimpses of Seattle. And it cost $2.94. It was a penny a glimpse. And it sold out and it had to be reprinted often. And, and so he put out another one called 494 for $4.94, and that one sold out as well. And he, over the years, um, became quite a legend with his Now and Then column. That This sort of grew out of these Glimpses books, which were collections of older photos in Seattle, and Paul had no idea he was going to become a historian. He still considers himself an artist, and a visual artist, a concert promoter, a, a uh, a filmmaker and editor, and uh, yet once he did these glimpses books and these were promoted in the Seattle Times, he connected with the editor of the Sunday Magazine, uh, Kathy Andresevich, and pretty soon he was doing Now and Then every week on Sunday. This is a column after his, th this sort of conferred his legendary status. This is a column from 2001. Uh, featuring a cover story on Paul himself. Um, now, he did, over 37 years, he did more than 1,800 columns. Can you imagine that? Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. How many of us have done 1,800 of anything? How many of us have done something every week for 37 years? I mean, it's phenomenal. 
And the concept of the column is very simple. And we all do it when we take family photos and so forth. It starts out with the evocative photo from the past, which we call a then photo. And then it features a modern photo taken from the same angle, right? And then there's brief text that accompanies it to bring out what you see in the photos and the changes in each. And the column is, uh, it's, it's, it's something that the Seattle Times embraced from the beginning, and we're so glad they continue to do so. You know, they claim that there are 300,000 eyes who see the Sunday Times every week, either in print or online. A lot of people get the Times and they share it in their family and so forth. And this column is both an informative way but an entertaining way to get at something that, that I like to quote. Anybody here remember Emma Watson? Yeah. He was our longtime columnist in the PI and the Times. Emma Watson called it a city's sense of itself, which he said, I, I, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about a, a feeling for its past and also a curiosity about its origins and a pride in its present. And I think this comes through in Paul's columns. It's not an unusual concept, as I said, but we think it's unique around the country. We don't think anybody's done it for that long. And so here are a couple of examples of Paul's uh, columns from the 80s and 90s. And uh, we, we, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal when you consider today that it usually is two pages. Sometimes it was a half page. Sometimes it was a third of a page. I mean, almost where you needed a microscope to see the photos but it was in almost every single week. Now, Gene and I have been friends of Paul for the nearly four decades since he started the column. Um, I helped writing, I helped him with writing the columns and the photography for them. In fact, I met him 40 years ago when I went down to his basement. I was editor of the West Seattle Herald. We were putting together a history uh, section, a 104 page section on the building of the West Seattle Bridge and the history of transportation in West Seattle. And I knew that Paul, from starting his column a year before, had some old photos. He took me down to his basement, pulled out some drawers, and he pulled out a two and a quarter by two and a quarter negative. It had a little rip in the top of it. And it was of the City of Seattle Ferry from 1890. And Paul just said, Here, take this. You know, how many people do that with you, that instant trust? He said, just get it back to me when you're done. And I did, and we became friends ever since. And Paul has also befriended uh, Gene as well. Gene is a master, among many things, but a master photographer. And uh, he's collaborated with Paul. Over the years, as Paul got older, he kind of receded into his basement. And Gene was the one out shooting the now photos for him. So, when Paul, who just turned 85, when Paul decided in 2019 to bid farewell to his column, Gene and I were honored to be his heirs apparent. This is Paul's final column. The fun thing about this is that the black and white photo on the bottom is the now photo that Paul shot for his first column. And the barista in the photo is holding the then photo for that column. So it's a then, and a then, and then a now. Paul's standing at the very corner there on 4th Avenue for this photo. And uh, so we are the heirs apparent to Paul. This came out um, in, in 2019. And we are so fortunate that the Times is committed to continuing the column. And in this post-Paul era, I mean, we've been through so much in the last, just the last three or four years. And I'm sure as you've taken your tours of the city or just looked out your windows, you can see there's a restaurant tour named Tom Douglas. Anybody know that name? Oh, sure. He, uh, he reminds us that Seattle is morphing with dizzying speed into its future self. That's a, that's a nice way of saying that a lot of old stuff's getting torn down and a lot of new stuff's being built. And so when Gene and I decided to take on this quest, we wanted to breathe new life into this uh, column. And uh, so that's what you're going to get today is a bunch of examples. And I didn't want to leave you hanging about Paul. Paul's still um, 
he's still uh, alive and he's still uh, bright and, uh, and, and very engaged. But he's largely horizontal in a nursing home up north in Shoreline. And this was taken just uh, a couple weeks ago, less than a couple weeks ago on Halloween. Um, Felix Bennell, if you listen to Cairo Radio on Wednesday mornings, he does a history segment on the Dave Ross Show. And so Felix is interviewing Paul at Shoreline and in this photo. We're just honored that Paul passed the baton. Now, as I said before, it all starts with a great then photo. And I wanted to show you this one. Um, if you can't see the headline, this is called The Hideous Remains. This is probably the most significant event in Seattle history, which is the Great Seattle Fire of 1889. All downtown, 30 blocks, was taken out by this fire. And this is what remained. And then you can see down below what uh, used to be in this site was the old Seattle Hotel. And down below, we have uh, <laughs> what is uh, charmingly called the sinking ship parking garage. This is down in Pioneer Square. Uh, but this was one of Paul's first columns, and we went back and, and redid it to, so that we could show the sinking ship. And let's see, we're going to go to another one. This was, this was Paul's first. Uh, really then photo that he delved into before the times for a little publication called the, the Seattle Sun. And this is in Belltown. And look at the upper left black and white photo and you can see three peaked roofs there on the upper left. And you can see them down below in the color photos. Um, these are the Wayne Apartments uh, on Belltown, in Belltown, in 2nd Avenue. And you can't see them anymore. This column ran this past summer to announce the fact that they were finally tearing them down. This is in the site of what uh, was known as the Denny Regrade, Big Hill that was here before, uh, before Belltown. So these are examples of Paul's uh, photos from his collection, but you might wonder, OK, Paul's not doing this. Where do we get the photos now, as Mike was alluding to? Well, we, we go to all kinds of sources, but the truth is that the supply is literally endless because they can come from anywhere, including you. Here's an example that came to me this past summer from uh, a woman whose parents courted and got married during the Seattle World's Fair. And I, they provided me this photo in the upper left, a color photo, no less, from 1962. What's different about this fairy photo? Can you tell? It's got an emblem that says Century 21 and the Century 21 logo on it. And this was quite the photo because it has two fairies in it. Each fairy has the emblem on it. And we're not used to it until just this month there being big ads on our fairies, are we? Uh, if you've read in the paper recently, if you know about the Coca-Cola controversy. But this ran in the summertime. And it's a great example of how photos can come from anywhere. Um, and the column ideas can come from anywhere, too. Um, oftentimes, we get them from historical societies and local heritage groups. And here are a couple of examples of columns I did uh, the last few years. On the left is uh, uh, <laughs> the headline says, what the Sam Hill is all the puzzle and bothle. Well, the Bothell Historical Society was doing a presentation on the history of roads in their city, up north. And so we did this column to promote that event for them, showing an old photo of Bothell's Main Street and a new photo uh, with the Historical Society people posing right where the old cars were. On the right, you can see a little bigger column. Uh, this was from last year in Ballard. Uh, Many of you may know about the, the Ballard Railroad Bridge and, the, and the, rail, the tracks that go through Ballard that really helped to build it. And Ballard Historical Society was putting together a book, uh, what they call a, uh, an Arcadia book with photos and captions. You've seen those all over town. And so the top photo was the cover photo for their book. And so we replicated it at the bottom, tried our best to have the women be in the same photos and and uh, of course, we always ask people to dress brightly. You know, red shows up really well in a color, <laughs> color photo. 
So a key component of our column is that we pick a great then photo, but it's got to be repeatable in the now. Sometimes you can't do that, and sometimes you've got to get a little imaginative. This one shows, many of you probably know on the right, that's Chief Seattle. That's the, the famed photo of Chief Seattle with his eyes closed. To the left is the photo of his daughter uh, named Kiki Soblu, who otherwise known uh, as Princess Angeline, who lived around the turn of the century here in Seattle, and she was famous at the time for posing for photos. She would do that for pay, not very much, but she would be there. And she's uh, sitting on a site that's 10 years before Pike Place Market was started up. And so we wanted to repeat this photo. We wanted to elevate the native heritage in, in the times. And so in the bottom, you can see the photo of two people. There's a, a woman and a man. The man is Ken Workman, who is the great, 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 great grandson of Chief Seattle. And the woman is Mary Lou Slaughter, who is uh, the daughter of Chief, descendant of the daughter of Chief Seattle. So we've got the two of them together, and they are in Post Alley, which is that sloping uh, sidewalk next to the market. Sometimes we try to get imaginative with uh, finding different angles. Now, this one is close to your, your home here. Um, we hired a helicopter. Has anybody, how many here have flown in a helicopter? Oh, fair number of you. I had never done so until a couple of years ago. It's one of the most serene experiences. I couldn't believe it. It felt like I was floating up there. And I was shooting video, and Gene was shooting stills. And we went around Seattle capturing scenes that we had from aerial photos of the past. This is of South Lake Union and the museum of, and, and the armory down at the south end of Lake Union, which is now Museum of History and Industry, just a few blocks from here. And so you can see how we were able to match the then and the now photos from the air. Um, but we don't all, always go up and get, that's a, a special experience. When we need to get up high, Gene has a 21-foot extension pole, and he puts his giant camera on it and sends the pole up in the air to get at angles that we couldn't get otherwise. For instance, this one on the left, this is a, a then and now about the, the old, uh, you call it the Mercer Island Tunnel, the Mount, Mount Baker Tunnel, uh, which is now squarish instead of roundish, uh, to go eastbound to Mercer Island. Well, to capture this photo, Gene had to open the hole in the top of his car and sent his camera up on the pole. And then uh, while his wife is driving, he's trying to capture it at the exact same moment there. And on the right, um, that, you know, that tunnel leads you out to the bridge and then takes you to Mercer Island. Well, over on Mercer Island, the oldest school, the oldest neighborhood was East Seattle. East Seattle is not in Seattle at all. It's on Mercer Island. And East Seattle had an elementary school that many people who are still alive today went to when they were kids my age. But it's been closed for decades, and there was a plan for it to be demolished. And so before it was demolished, one of the East Seattle alums organized a group photo. Now notice in the then photo, we've got kids out there exercising. They're doing their calisthenics. So, all these people who came for the group photo in the now down in the color photo below, they're doing some calisthenics as well, just to try to match it. Now, when we began talking about taking over the column for Paul, you can see many of the columns were only one page. But, and because of that, we limit the text. We limit it to 430 words, which is not very many words. And Yet, we have started, actually we started a couple years ago, submitting more photos to the Times, asking them, we need more space to tell the story. And so most of the time in the last year and a half, two years, the Times has given us two full pages and full color. We're so happy about this. This is a, an example of that, um, which is about the taking down of the Tacoma totem pole two years ago. The one that stood there since, um, since Teddy Roosevelt was president and came to visit Tacoma and they put it up and whoops and 
they had it as the sort of the star of a 1920s silent movie called Eyes of the Totem. But it was carved for commercial purposes, and it was not carved by the native Puyallup Indians. And so the city, in its wisdom, decided that it had to be taken down. And it was, uh, you can see how a column like this can get into contentious issues uh, of our time. You know, do you preserve history so it can be seen and interpreted, or do you take it away because it's not considered to be correct? And so they cut this into about eight pieces, um, and the city then stored it for a while. They gave the top and the bottom pieces to the Tacoma Historical Society. They gave the rest of them to the Puyallup tribe. And I understand that the top and bottom pieces are now with the tribe as well, but the Tacoma <coughs> Historical Society decided it didn't want to keep them. And I'm going to be doing a follow-up on this to find out what the tribe did with the pieces of wood. But this is a great way of seeing how you need more than one page to tell a story sometimes. Here's one that's close to you, out at Seattle Center. This is another, this is not quite two pages, about a page and two thirds. This is out near Memorial Stadium where Troy Laundry used to operate. And look at all of those horse and wagon laundry vehicles. And it's just fascinating to look at the photo itself. Great, great story. And then some columns you just do out of fun and they need to be two pages. I did this one um, spring of last year. Anybody remember when Paul McCartney came here, did a couple of shows? He was just on the cusp of being 80 years old. He's still performing at 80 now. Well, I thought, I gotta do it now and then on this. You know, Paul's coming to Seattle. Well, when's the last time he came? Well, he came in 91, I think, when, when he played at the Kingdom. Um, but when did he first come? Well, of course, it was in 1964. Did anybody go to that concert who was in this room? Ah, no hands. Well, there are people around who went to that concert when they were teenagers in 64 at the Coliseum. I don't call it Climate Pledge Arena. I call it the Coliseum. <laughs> and when they came, I thought, well, how, you know, a photo of the Beatles from in concert, it looks the same no matter where they are. What did they do that was different here? Well, the famous thing they did was they stayed at the Edgewater Inn and they fished out the window. And then through Facebook, um, I went to several Seattle heritage sites and asked for people to get a hold of me if they were at the concert. And I got about 15 people and then eventually narrowed down to four whose heads you can see peeking out the window in the right-hand photo. I figured they could be the Beatles, right? Because they were at the concert. And uh, they're all women. You know, one of the headlines in 1964 said that the audience was 90% girls. And they were all screaming. Anyway, another example of how you need two pages to tell the story. Now, underlying everything we do is is, is a haunting notion, I referred to it before, and that, that is that someday soon there may no longer be a print times. Now I've got to tell you as a journalist, I've been worked for four papers, uh, it's, it's in my blood. It's not the physical print that is the thing, it's the fact that when you pick up a newspaper, and you may be going to the sports section to see what the Mariners are doing, but on the way you might, oh, I didn't know about that, oh, I should read about that. It's what I call drive-by readership. You don't get that on the internet. Everybody goes to their niches on the internet. And so it's really a, a, a crisis of, of public, you know, we, we have more information now than we ever had before, and I think we're dumber than we've ever been before because we don't have a mainstream, I'll get off this, that soapbox, but anyway. We have to be re recognizing that uh, everything we do is online as well, so this is what, you would go, if you went to the Times site and looked up now and then, this is what you would see. You'd see the current one from last weekend, and then you'd see the previous ones, and you can click on them and go to them. <laughs> and there may be a day when now and, line, now and then will be online only. Although, we did talk with our editors about this a couple of years ago, and they said, you know, we may cut back on day, days of the week for print, but the last one to survive will be Sunday. So that's good omen for us. So we're trying to uh, anticipate the online audience 
here's what it looks like if you go online. My column on Babe Ruth being in Seattle that was up a couple of weeks ago, this is what you would see there. And instead of seeing all the photos laid out like they are in a print page, you click on the right side of the photo. How many of you have done this? You click on the right side and it flips to new photos. So there were about six or seven photos that went with this one. So we're trying to anticipate the online audience, particularly, you know, it's the younger audience. And we're also aware of the massive influx, influx of, of newcomers to Seattle. We've all read about this. The city grew by 10,000 just in the last few years, mainly to Amazon and tech workers, but it's just growing. And, and they, you know, I don't care if you've been here 40 years or 40 minutes, <laughs> you still want a sense of home. You still want to be connected to where you are. And many of them don't have a sense of history that we take for granted. And so we have to write the column, not so that they're long timers, we're assuming that, but that they're people who haven't been around here much. Here are a couple of examples from a couple of years ago. One on the left is, is what used to be the Beaker Holim Synagogue up in the central area. And the Jewish population was really concentrated there. But over the years, it moved south to the Seward Park area. And what this building is now is um, the, oh, come on. Do you ever lose a word? Who, who can help me here? <laughs> All of us do, yes. <laughs> Langston Hughes, it's the Langston Hughes Cultural Center and it largely serves the oh. black community. And so we got not only a photo of the building for the now, but we got a bunch of people on the upper part who were largely black teenagers who were rehearsing a play inside. And then down below the bottom line are people of our age who uh, are from Seattle's Jewish community, sort of showing the changes in the community that this one building represents. And on the right is a really kind of funny one. Um, I look really closely at that black and white photo. I should have blown this up. It's about a third of the way from the left in the, in the uh, photo that 40 years ago, uh, our county executive, Dow Constantine, went to see the Rolling Stones in the kingdom. And so he's there, and his face is looking kind of stern, like this. Like, what are you all doing? But he's in the front row. So the Stones came back a couple years ago, but they didn't, there's no kingdom. You know, they played at the football stadium. And, and, and so, uh, he went to that, and uh, I, I know Dow from way back. He's from West Seattle like I am. And, and uh, I said, Dow, you're going. Can you, can you get somebody to take a photo of you in the same position? And he said, sure. And so you can see him prominent in the lower left of the photo. But the reason I use this as an example of talking with newcomers is I had to explain what is a kingdom. <laughs> you know? I mean... We have, we have short memories, and, and people assume that what is here has always been there. It's not the case. A little funny note about this photo that Dow sent me. I asked him, you know, i got to have a photo credit for this. Uh, who shot this for you? And he, he typed back to me, some guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I turned it into the Times. I hope that they would that they put down there some guy, but they didn't. They said courtesy of Dow Constantine. <laughs> Here's another one that I think appeals to newcomers, and that is just the, the uh, uh, skyline of the city. Now, I had this postcard, this, this horizontal postcard, kicking around in my collection. I'm kind of a pack rat. I've had it for decades, and it turns out it's from just after the World's Fair. Well, geez, a lot has changed since the early 60s, wouldn't you think? And this also is an example, and so you, you get a chance to show newcomers how uh, how things have changed and, and how things have stayed the same. Some things are the same in this photo. And this was taken both times in the then and in the now from a tiny park at the, at the top of the Magnolia Bridge looking back towards Seattle. Um, and this is also an example of something I wanted to bring up, which is that in our text that Gene and I tell, try to tell personal stories. And not to be self-aggrandizing, but to have, talk about us in first person, to, to try to get people into the column so that you can identify with us as if you are us. 
And I started this column, because I live in West Seattle, I said, you know, one of my favorite things is to go to Hamilton Viewpoint just a few blocks away and with, with somebody else. And I said, what's your favorite building on the skyline? And everybody's got a different answer. And I say, well, I've got a favorite building. And it's the terminal sales building at First in Virginia. Because without that building, I would not be here. And I tell the story of my dad coming out from Kentucky and working on the 10th floor, and my mom working on the first floor, and that's how they met. But you can see the terminal sales building pretty prominently two thirds of the way over on the right in the, in the then photo. Today, uh uh. <laughs> it's buried. You can't see it at all. But it's a way of, again, trying to get people to identify with the column. Um, another example of that, this is one that Gene wrote, and it's about the old Greyhound terminal. How many took Greyhound when you were a younger kid? How many took Greyhound in Seattle? So yes, so you know this old station, and then this is, you know, Gene has been photographing for a long time. So there's a then, and a, a sort of now, and then a real now. Um, so you've seen this property change over time, and he led the column with his own uh, Greyhound trips when he went to college. Gene and I alternate each week in the column, and you, you'll see my, my name there, and then Gene's, and my, but we back each other up. Sometimes I'll shoot photos for him, or vice versa. Um, and it's just, I gotta say, it's a, it's a joy to have a partner to work with. Paul was doing it largely by himself. And that takes a lot of initiative. But I, I've got somebody I can, I can collaborate with, I can brainstorm with, I can vent with, I can argue with. I mean, it's, it's great. Gene's my, one of my best friends. So we bring lots of strategies to the text. We conduct new interviews. We consult online archives. Um, we inject anecdotes. Here's another personal anecdote. In fact, if you look and squint really closely, you can see um, the photo that's on the right, that's me. On the far right of the fo photo of the two of us, Brad Christman and me. This is obviously about the Virginia Five. And it uh, was celebrating its centennial, so we wanted to do a column that, that, uh, that, that celebrated that. The then and the now are, sometimes the times lays it out in a different way, but you can see there are, there's a then and the now on the left side of the, of the boat out in Elliott Bay, and I really couldn't get it out in Elliott Bay, so this is in, in uh, Lake Union. It's, it's moored just up the street here, um, next to Mohai. But I also wanted to get people in there, and so you can see the photo of its maiden voyage down in the lower right, and people are getting on. So we, we uh, uh, repeated that with people in the same poses made it kind of fun. And the reason I'm there is that I started the column talking about uh, the Historical Society in West Seattle, which I was president of back in 1989, 88, 89. Um, I, I, uh, we, we did a reenactment of the first ferry boat on Puget Sound, which was back in the 1888. But that ferry boat's long gone, and so we had the Virginia Five stand in its place. And, went from downtown to West Seattle and then all over the Sound. And our board vice president said, everybody must have had a good time. Nobody left early. <laughs> um, <laughs> but some of the, the, the things we try to do are to be pointed. Now, we're not wearing masks today, at least most of us aren't. But there was a time recently, and you know, there's some people who didn't want to wear masks. I did a column on, on the masking from the pandemic, but this is where it, it's just a beautifully delicious connection of the past and the present because people generally don't realize that people had to wear masks 100 years ago during the flu epidemic. And so there's this newsboy standing in front of a closed theater during the flu epidemic and he's wearing a mask. And so the idea was to, rec to, to, to reinforce the fact that not only was mask wearing a good thing, but uh, uh, it also was something that affected the future, our kids. And <laughs> one little sidelight, 
you're, you don't always get everything in the paper you want. I, had, I quoted a, a city finance official for this story. I, he was quoted in 1918 in the Seattle Times as saying, I don't like masks. It makes me feel like a Ku Klux. And my editor took that out. And I tried to argue with him. He said, no, we can't do it. It'll take too much long time to explain. They didn't, they didn't think people would understand that he was talking about the Ku Klux Klan. Another example. Uh, this one's kind of fun. Remember I said everything starts with a then photo? Yeah. Well, I thought, you know, let's, what was, you know, pe people drive by, it's not just but a few blocks from you here, the Amazon spheres. What was there before the Amazon spheres? Isn't it funny that when we, you know, it takes, I don't know, a few weeks or months, and we can't remember what was there before? It's a funny thing that goes on in our mind. So I wondered what was there before, and I went to the state tax archive, state uh, uh, photo archive, which was based on tax uh, assessment photos taken in the 30s and on up. And this one was just a beautiful photo, um, the, the black and white one. What it showed that in the place of the spheres was all these car dealerships. And there were cars lined up on the street at the, at the uh, stoplight. And I thought, and so I wrote about this, like the cars were little spheres of their own, you know, because they all had rounded tops in that time. And then you find extra things. What I did with this column was to kind of go through what was in the newspaper the day that that photo was taken in 1956. I, I, is it 50? Oh, 57. And I came out, this was in the Times as an ad for Frederick Nelson. Again, it's a dome. And I know you can't read it, so I'm going to read it to you. This is one of the most funny ads I've ever seen. Can you imagine what it's, it's advertising? And this is years before the Jetsons, OK? The, the type below says that this is 2000 AD. For us now, that's 23 years ago. But this is 1957. The man of tomorrow may fly his super flexiplane to the ultra-chrome dome home of his heart's desire. But the gift that will bring her running to the door will be those beautiful, round-the-clock, superb shears. Women of any age love the perfect fit that a choice of 42 individual leg patterns gives. Don't wait until 2000 AD, though, to bring your life of love running. You can get round the clocks today. These pairs even come in a complimentary red suede gift box. <laughs> Only $1.95. <laughs> Fun stuff. We are especially on the lookout for imaginative approaches to capture your attention. And this, was, this came up. There was a family uh, who contacted me and said, we have this photo of this giant stained glass artwork. Seven by ten feet. I mean, that's bigger than any of us in this room. Huge. And it, and it used to be in a hotel downtown, but they didn't know where it went. And it was created by the company called Seuss and Smith. Not Seuss like Dr. Seuss. It's spelled differently. And they were downtown on Elliott Avenue. So we have the old photo of Seuss and Smith, and then we have the families who are related to these people in the now photo of Susan Smith. But the idea was to ask readers, help us solve this mystery. And we finally, we got phone calls and emails that indicated that this thing is up in Alaska, in storage. So that was kind of fun. Here's another unusual one that we, we could talk about imaginative. The upper photo is a panorama down at, at Second of Virginia. And it's of women's suffragettes. And they are holding up issues of a suffragette newspaper. And so we thought, OK, how can we repeat this in the now? Let's get all of the elected <laughs> officials who are women to come and pose in the now. And we first nailed down Jenny Durkin, who was mayor, mayor then. And uh, then we contacted all the others we could think of and some relatively famous female uh, local like, like the, the director of the uh, uh, North, Northwest African American Museum. And we had them all line up, and we asked the, the League of Women voters to come and hold up some vote signs to fill it out. 
So we've got all these women, mostly women. There are a few men if you look closely. And we lined them up. And I mean, it, this was at 10 o'clock on a, I don't remember, a Thursday or whatever. It was whatever fit Jenny Durkin's schedule. And we had them all put their hands in the air that they were in favor of voting, right? And we had invited all of the elected officials. And most of them had shown up. So I'm shoot, I'll, I'll get to the 360 later. I'm holding the 360 camera, and Gene is shooting the photo. And OK, we're done. We're done. And everybody, thank you very much. They start dispersing. What happened 10 seconds later? Pramila Jayapal showed up. She trumped everybody in, in the place. Come back! Come back! And we couldn't get everybody back, but we got as many as we could. And you can see we got a great comparison here to tell the story of women's suffrage locally. OK. I've said this several times already, but we, we, try, we look for then examples that have people in them. And if the, even if they don't have people, we put people in the now. So here's one about uh, Motorcycle Club up by Volunteer Park, not far from here on Capitol Hill, then and now. Here's one. Uh, how many know where this is? If you've, if you've been there, you know. Raise your hand. Des Moines. Des Moines. Very good. This is the Masonic home. Uh, the plan is to tear it down. Um, this was put on last year, put on the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation's endangered list. And so uh, we got quite a few people, a number of them from Des Moines, to pose in the now to come be this, the uh, complement of the grand opening of the Masonic home then. And again, I would submit that if a photo has got people in it, you're going to stay on the page more. And also, every one of those people in the column is going to be a foot soldier for you. Make sure that everybody sees the link and goes out and gets a paper. Here's a case where just one photo, one person in a photo, um, you know, Paul used to do a lot of just building and building. But uh, Gene and I are looking for people opportunities, and so this is Plymouth Church, just a few blocks away, uh, downtown, and you can see the, the then and the now, but the little Plymouth pillars, we have the pastor of Plymouth Church there. And this focuses on their current campaign to what they call pay real rent to the Duwamish Indians. And this one was kind of fun. Last year, the, when the pandemic was winding down, parades started again in, in King County. We didn't have them for several years. And the first one of the season was in Fall City. So we've got a then and a second then down the lower right. Those are little uh, uh, soapbox cars. And then the now up in the upper right. And the same building is in the background of each one. We did face a challenge with this one, though. Gene was terrific in, in meeting the challenge, because the parade today goes on the same route along the highway along the river in Fall City, but it goes the opposite direction. So how do you match that? We managed to get this drill team, when they stopped and did a show, while they're turning around, it looks like they're going in the same direction as the them. <laughs> so we played some tricks sometimes. Now, Paul, every once in a while we tell Paul what we're doing with the column, and he says, oh, no, you can't do that. I already did that. Uh, but Paul, that was 1987. Uh, I think there are a few new people who have come around since then, or even if it was in 1987, people won't remember that you did it back then. So sometimes we tackle the same topic with, with uh, a different photo. And this, of course, we, we do a lot with the Seattle World's Fair, and many in this room probably went to the Seattle World's Fair. But this was Seattle's first World's Fair, the AYPE, the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. And one of the people in the audience here is Dan Curley, who has an AYPE.com website. And he, he's here today. He's the one who talked with you last spring. Some of you were here for his Mount Rainier talk. And he's here to keep me honest today. But this is, uh, this is the AYPE looking northbound. And we had to get up really high on, I can't remember the name of the building, to shoot and get the same example. And I remember in this column that I asked people to count how many American flags were in the den. I don't know right now, but there's 
easily dozens of them. We try to be timely. We deal with anniversaries, trendy topics, holidays. Uh, and, and this is sometimes difficult because you may not realize when this is in a particular Sunday's paper, we had to turn this in five weeks earlier. <coughs> five weeks because the magazine is pre-printed. So uh, we, we knew that the uh, 50th anniversary of Neil Armstrong walking on the moon was happening. Well, there was a big event that day in the Seattle hospital that there was a little baby born. And in Neil's honor, he was named Neil Armstrong Dial. So we tracked him down. He's living in Tacoma. And you can see him as he's growing up as a teenager, meeting Neil Armstrong himself, and then down below at the exhibit at the Museum of Flight. Another timely topic. This is from last summer. I waited a couple of years. I had this photo in hand, but I waited a couple of years because I wanted it to be on the centennial. This was when Warren G. Harding, as president, visited Seattle. He spoke to 30,000 people here at Woodland Park, and he also spoke to 30,000 out at the UW, what we now call Husky Stadium. And about three days later, he died. He, he, had caught, he was on a Western tour. He had caught some bug up in Alaska on his way through Seattle, and he died. Um, how do we repeat this in the now? You know what's going on there now? It's just giraffes. <laughs> And so a friend of mine who's a presidential historian, I had him come out and be the person in the now photo while there are some giraffes cavorting in the background. <laughs> and this one's a fav favorite. Mike, how am I doing on time? Doing real good. Oh, where are we? Five more minutes. Oh, my. I'm going to have to hurry. You all know the Pacific Science Center. There is a proposal that came out last uh, winter for them to fill in the back pool of the, of, you know, where the big arches are? The back pool of the center with dirt and make it a meadow. And the reason is that they don't have the money to fix the leaking water. It's millions and millions of dollars. And so I thought this was a timely topic. And the time set, that's another screwy thing. Sometimes you think this is a news story and the news side should do something about it. But they said, go ahead, do it in your column. So we did. And, uh, and the now photo, you can see the then and now from the bottom. I've worked with the, the photo of that area looking through the slats of the Space Needle ramp. So Gene went up and got the same angle, so you can see the same thing. Not much has changed. But I also got somebody from the Science Center to explain the proposal there in the background. And up above in Time Magazine is the architect. Um, but the thing I'm really glad about is the ending of the column, which you know goes through the pros and cons, and then finally it says, we'll see what happens, but this proposal may turn out to be all wet. <laughs> and they haven't done it yet, and they are recalibrating what they're, I'm not saying this column had a, had a singular effect. There were stories in other media. Sometimes we get to do more than a column. We get to do cover stories. I just wanted to show you the covers. I got to do a cover story on Wanda Wanda. How many remember Wanda Wanda? Oh, dear, my dear heart. She preceded all of these uh, guys who were the kids' show stars, and she was the best. Uh, she died at, a, at, a, at a, somebody said, 101, W-U-N. And then we did a, a now and then approach to uh, the 40th anniversary of Mount St. Helens eruption. Uh, with interviews of 40 people. We did a Valentine's Day special, uh, then and now, of, of Valentine couples. And then we did, like, you know, this is during the pandemic. How do, you, how do you go on a vacation if you can't go anywhere? Well, you do it vicariously, and you explore the vacations of your past. And so we got people to submit then photos, and then we got now photos. This cute little girl in the red, this is from uh, the, the early 1960s in New York City. And then I got a friend in New York City to go nab a little kid and shoot somebody on the same ferry. The Horiuchi mural at Seattle Center, again, not far from here. Um, 
we post a lot of extra stuff on our blog called pauldorpat.com. And this is an example of that. This is a now and then of the Horiuchi mural. This is my favorite part of Seattle Center. It's the most beautiful mural. You all know where this is at the foot of the Space Needle. The Horiuchi family was having a reunion. And I found out about that through a friend of the family. And so decided to do a now and then. That's the family back a couple of years after the World's Fair. And then over here on the left, they made the, the now bigger this time. That's the family today who was there. And I also did video interviews of these family members. And so this is, these are examples of things you can get on our website if you go to pauldorpat.com. Just remember Paul's name and .com, and you're there. And you can always see many more photos and videos and news clips for every single column. And if you want to get notified every week of when this comes, do you see the red arrow that I put on there? You just enter your email address, and boom, you'll get it in your email inbox every week. Um, and then I'm going to show you, um, we also do something that's a little different um, with a 360 degree camera. There's a camera that's about this big, about as big as a hot dog, that Gene and I put on top of this pole, and we will shoot an area when we're shooting the now photo. A 360-degree camera shows everything, 360 degrees, and it's video. And so we post these videos online, um, and then we superimpose the, the then and now photos while whichever of us has written the column reads the column. So you can mouse around in the, in the video and see the surroundings um, at the same time as you're hearing the column read to you. And I was going to show you an example of it, but the time is short. But this is this was the very first one we did. And I, I'll spare you because I'm sure it's going to be a tech mix-up that I can't fix. But this will give you an idea. This was on the last day that you could drive on the viaduct. Gene and I, Gene was driving and I was holding the camera up through the roof of his car. And just imagine mousing all around to West Seattle and downtown as you're driving the viaduct. Um, this was something that we thought that uh, posterity would appreciate 1,500 years from now. And finally, we try to never lose sight of Paul's idiosyncratic humor. You can see the gleam in his eye here. This is from 2007. Um, and we've witnessed this all through the years. And I'm going to tell you just to really shrink down this anecdote. 15 years ago, there was a great, great advertising campaign that Ivers was uh, behind. They were out in the out opposite, between downtown and West Seattle. They had a boat, that, and they had divers, and they were pulling up what they were saying were underwater billboards that Ivor Hagelin himself had put there because he knew that mass transit was the thing of the future, and people would be traveling underwater. So he wanted them to know about his clam chatter. Well, it was all a ruse. It was a hoax. There were no such thing as underwater billboards. But this was this was going to be the ad campaign for Ivers, right? Well, if a Seattle Times photographer happened to be driving around Duwamish Head at the time that they were pulling up the sign, you know, and there were videographers there, and you see the guys cheering, we found the billboards. Well, this Times photographer shot this, and they said, this is, sounds like a story. And so they had a reporter named Eric Lasitas do the story. And Eric interviewed a number of people. And of course, he wanted to get his history right, so he went to Paul Dorpat. And Paul, who was in on the hoax, didn't betray the hoax. He said, well, it could be. It could have been. It was, a, a, you know, I was a, an impression guy. Anyway, this ran in the paper. But a week later, the word got out that this was a hoax. And in the second story that Eric did, it said that Paul Dorpat was scheduled for a meeting with the executive editor, Dave Boardman, about the future of his job. <laughs> because they didn't like the fact that he was, what they were saying, lying about this. You know, newspapers are supposed to be about the truth. And Paul was adamant. Paul, you know, Gene and I, we, we both talked to him for hours on the phone. I said, Paul, you have to apologize. 
what do I, I'm not going to apologize. I'm just going to, I'm going to stay in my basement and write my book. Forget the column. I'm not going to do this anymore. You have to apologize, Paul. You have to. Because people's memories are short. And if you're not in the paper every week, people are going to forget about you. You have to apologize. And finally, he told me, uh, if I have to apologize, you're going to write it for me. And so I did, and here's the column that appeared five weeks later, and on the right side is an apology to readers by Paul. <laughs> but that gives you a sense of his sense of humor and what makes him so lovable. Well, we're thrilled to be doing this column. We hope that you will feed us column ideas and photos. Remember, each column starts with a great then photo. And if you would, and you know, that's our contact info. I don't see anybody scribbling it down, but you can come talk to me afterward or just go to pauldorpat.com, you'll find it. And if you want to see a showcase of now and then, this is the book that we did as a tribute to Paul back in 2018. Gene and I did. It's a coffee table book. Uh, 200 pages, beautiful photos. All of the now photos have been reshot by Gene. We picked the 100 best now and then out, out of all of Paul's 1800. And with Mike's help, we're going to donate a copy of this to your library. So please take a look at it, will you? OK, one last little commercial. Don't miss three weeks from now. How many of you remember Charlotte Bashu? Of course. <laughs> That is a fascinating story in itself. And what I'm going to do three weeks from now is take you through, dissect the whole column from the beginning to the very end of how this column came about. And I, I'm sure those of you, particularly those of you who, who knew Charlotte, will find this of interest. She, she was just a sweetheart. I, I appreciated her so much. And uh, that's it. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Any questions? I'm interested in what was on the site of Mirabella. And I have a friend from college who said she was married at the Broadway temple that was around here where one of the parking lots for Seattle Times eventually took it out. Can you? Do you have any info? I don't have any pictures, but I, I'm curious. You know, a few days ago, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to be speaking at Mirabella. They're going to want to know that. <laughs> and so I contacted the State Archives. This is a roundabout answer, but it'll get to your point. We were so fortunate. We were one of five counties in the whole country that got a WPA grant back in the 1930s to document every single standing building in King County. And this wasn't an altruistic project. This was to make sure that the county got tax revenue. There was a lot of speculation that the assessor was not assessing properties equally or even missed properties entirely. And so they got a grant, and they went around and interviewed everybody, put together a property record card, and took a photo of every standing building in the mid-30s. and then. If you got a, uh, let's say you wanted to add a dormer to your house, you know, well, they would come out in 19, say it was 1951, they would take another picture of your house that showed the dormer in so they could justify the tax assessment. And so in some cases, some properties have three or four of these prints, and they're just precious, uh, precious prints. You saw a couple of them in the slideshow with the white writing on them. And because in those days, they just wrote right on the negative. You can't recover that. And uh, so this became their records until computers came in in the late 70s. Well, what do you do with this great archive of card, property cards and photos? The, the county gave them to the state archives. And there is a state archives that operates in a, uh, a building at Bellevue College that has all of these cards. and they scan the photos. Anyway, long story short, I contacted Midori there earlier this week and I said, um, I said, can you tell me what was on the site of Mirabella? 
And her first question, because she's always busy, is, well, what's your deadline? <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm going to be back here in a few weeks. So I said, I don't really have a deadline. But if, you know, later this month or early December, you could tell me, at least I could get back to them. So I've, I had somebody tell me once that the kindest thing you can say to anybody is, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> so I will. Come, come in three weeks. Are there any other questions for Clay? Well, um, Clay, thank you very much. We'll be seeing Clay in three weeks, November 29th, and he will take us to oh, the story that was printed in October 22nd at Seattle Times. So I hope to see you then, and Clay, thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you.